my privilege to welcome to this week in Virginia, to welcome back, and it's been a long time, uh, a good friend, Delegate Lamont Bagby, who was elected in 2015. Uh, from, but before that, many of us around Capitol Square knew Delegate Bagby from his work on the Henrico County School Board. And his district includes Charles City County and parts of Henrico and, and the city of Richmond. Uh, Delegate Bagby got his bachelor's degree at Norfolk State and his master's at VCU. And his day job, as many legislators have such, is a director of operations at the Peter Paul Development Center. And if that were not enough, he's the chair of the, of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. So Lamont, we're just delighted to have you on. It's, it's it seemed like it's been almost a year. It's been a long time. And, and this uh, post-pandemic time that we're in, I'm delighted to have you on and have you talk with our viewers some about the 2022 session. So jump in at any place that you want to about the session, the session that's still going on right now as we, we talk, and uh, tell us your perspective on what has happened and maybe what has not happened. Yeah, yeah. thank you, David, and, and always good to be with you. And uh, so much has changed since the last time we were together. Uh, some of the, the, uh, the, the bio that you laid out for me uh, has changed as well. Uh, but I'm happy to be with you. Uh, the 2022 session uh, was a real opportunity for the Commonwealth, and that's no surprise to anyone. Uh, it was an opportunity for the General Assembly, which is split, uh, and the newly elected governor. Uh, because as you know, being around for, uh, for quite a bit of time, uh, the Commonwealth has never been as flush with cash uh, as it is right now. Even through these tough times that we're experiencing with gas prices and shortage in materials and supplies, uh, the Commonwealth is experiencing surpluses like, uh, like she's never experienced before. And so that's an opportunity for us to make not only long-term investments in public education and public safety uh, and infrastructure, but it's also an opportunity to make uh, one-time uh, uh, investments in the Commonwealth, whether that be uh, uh, infrastructure, growth, bridges, uh, schools. We missed a number of those opportunities in this past session. And it's my hope that as we continue to experience surpluses and we go into the 2023 session, that we will really look at the opportunities before us uh, to invest in the Commonwealth. Uh, we, we, we see these sort of schemey uh, thoughts and ideas that I don't believe voters uh, and citizens of the Commonwealth are falling for, but you know, who knows what a little, political, a little political spin and shiny commercials can convince individuals to do uh, and to, and to, and to, uh, to bite. So it's my hope that we will invest in, really invest in, in, in putting money in school infrastructure, really invest in roads and bridges and, and push back on some of the uh, gimmicks like the uh, freeze on the gas tax, which is not really gonna benefit or not, not, not at all gonna benefit constituents uh, across the Commonwealth. What it will be is the opportunity to give more money to uh, big gas companies. You know, one of the, one of the things that, that in updating your biography and, and the information, uh, I, I could have said you're in the 74th House District. That was as a result of your last election. Uh, up, update us some on what's the shape of the new district that you reside in? Yeah, so I lost Charles City in the last redistricting. What was that? 2019 seems like 10 years ago. But I lost Charles City then. And then I lost Richmond in, the, uh, in this recent redistricting. Uh, and so now I only serve uh, or represent, rather, 
Henrico, and my my district has moved further west, and so now I can't say that I solely serve uh, uh, or represent Eastern Henrico because I'm all the way uh, up to Willow Law now. Okay, well, thank thank you for that that update. So it. The time the next election comes, and it looks like that will be 23 and not not a special in 22, uh, it'll be just a portion of the county of Henrico. Yeah, and I was hoping, to be frank with you on that, I was hoping that we would run in 2023, I mean 2022, uh, but looks like that ship has sailed, and uh, we just need to get geared up for 23. Now, after that long effort that... Uh, Paul Goldman made, I was seeing where somebody else had filed a suit, but it, it, it seems rather late to be doing that. And I'm not sure how long it'll take the courts to deal, deal with the most recent filing to try to call for a special election uh, in, in 22. Yeah, it would have been nice for someone uh, um, to have filed uh, at the same time that Paul Goldman was filing. Uh, so that we will have that uh, case as well. But not many people seem to want to run in 22, Democrats or Republicans. Uh, I was one of a, of, a, of a handful. Well, I tell our viewers we're having a conversation at the beginning of the week where you, you, the General Assembly is scheduled to come back on this Friday, uh, the 17th. And... So the governor has, I believe, until Thursday the 16th to provide the General Assembly with any proposed amendments. Is, is that the timetable you're looking at? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Well, there, there certainly have been some indications of, uh, from the governor, from the governor's uh, staff about some amendments that may be offered, but I guess we're every everyone, the legislature and the rest of us are on hold waiting until he actually actually uh, releases those. Uh, Delegate Bagby, I was looking back at your committee assignments and I saw from your uh, education interests that the education committee is the one that you're not serving on, that you served on initially, but still serving on uh, other the other committees, the Transportation Committee, uh, Commerce now called Commerce and Energy Committee, and on the on the Rules Committee, um, comment if you would please on some of the work of of those committees because I think our regular viewers know that most legislation really lives or dies in committees. So, uh, Transportation, Commerce, or Rules, uh, talk to us a little bit about those. Yeah, and you know, I was upset with the speaker for a bit, but then I understand that uh, elections have consequences. And uh, when we uh, had to decrease the number of Democrats on respective committees, then each of us had to lose a, a committee each. Uh, I was not happy to leave education committee uh, because I spent my professional career in education, and so that's a space that I feel very comfortable in. But also, I uh, have grown to enjoy serving on transportation um, because there's a, a quite a few dollars, uh, a, a quite a bit of the Commonwealth budget that flows through transportation, and it significantly impacts so many other things. And we've been able to do some great things, particularly for the Richmond region. Uh, supporting uh, the transportation initiatives for the region. And we've also encouraged and uh, supported the localities as they work together uh, to fund projects that will impact the entire region and encourage them to work on mass transit and supporting their efforts there, whether it's the Pulse or GRTC, uh, regular transportation system. Uh, that that that's important uh, as it relates to uh, commerce and labor, commerce and energy. Now, uh, I've had an opportunity to work on a number of things. One that I think I'm most proud of, uh, as it relates to my time in the General Assembly, is uh, getting rid of predatory lenders in the Commonwealth. Uh, 
Uh, that is something that I worked on since I, I, I came to the legislature. And I was happy that we were able to get that passed while we were in the majority and was able to push back on Republicans' effort to roll it back this last session. Another thing I'm proud of is my work on electric vehicle that also has been in the commerce and energy space and trying to make sure that the Commonwealth gets its fair share of electric vehicles. Uh, there were some op-eds in the paper this weekend from not only the auto dealers, but also uh, advocates for clean energy uh, laying out why we need electric vehicles uh, and why we need to support the infrastructure uh, as long, along with the rebates uh, so that we can make sure that individuals have somewhere to plug those vehicles in. And also the rebates that will be important to make sure that all individuals have access to those vehicles uh, that will, I think, uh, transition to be the new smartphone. And I say that because mm. 20 years ago, we all had flip phones. Um, right. We transitioned to smartphones and relied on, now we rely upon our phones to do a lot more uh, than we did before. We were carrying multiple devices. We carried a uh, Walkman for, for music. We carried uh, uh, a flip phone. We carried uh, a camera. Now we're carrying all that in one. Not even uh, do you now need a wallet. Uh, all that is now on your phone. And so we are looking towards moving up the same way with our transportation and making sure that the vehicles that we are purchasing in the Commonwealth, or at least we have an opportunity to purchase in the Commonwealth, are uh, electric vehicles. You know, as you as you rattled off all those changes that are taking place from the flip phone to the smartphone and all of that, it's uh, it's challenging to realize that that took place in a fairly short period of time. So it, it could very very well be that some of us moving from gas to hybrid will be moving to electric uh, vehicles in the in the very very near future. Um, let me ask you about your district, uh, Doug Bagby. Uh, your 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 new district, part of Enrico, uh, and and talk a little bit about passenger rail. I don't know if I don't know if Staples Mill, if the Amtrak station is in your your district, uh, but I think there's there's certainly strong interest in in the greater Richmond area, Enrico and all the rest, and throughout the Commonwealth to to do what we can to increase uh, get vehicles whatever kind of vehicles they are, get them off the interstates when we can and, and get people using passenger rail. Any any thoughts you have on that? Well, I, I appreciate uh, the advocacy, particularly on the federal level, from our uh, uh, from uh, Senators Warner and Kane and Congressman McKeachin and Spanberger. Uh, we're going to make sure that we uh, receive some of the dollars that the federal government is putting in for infrastructure. And that's one of the things that we need to also point out and, 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 and highlight as it relates to how we, are, how we have been able to come out of this pandemic uh, better financially as a commonwealth than when we went into it. That's largely because of the advocacy that, uh, that our congressional uh, delegation has, uh, has put, and the work that they put in working alongside the Biden administration to make sure that we have those resources. Uh, and, and so not only am I thrilled about the, the rail, but also a couple of months ago, we did a, uh, we had a meeting with Senator Warner and the team over at Richmond uh, at, at the airport, which is also in my district. Uh, and so on one end, you have the, the, right. the Rail and on the other side of the district, there's, there's the airport. And so uh, the infrastructure and investment that we put into, we're putting into the airport and what we're looking at ahead for the airport is, is, is also critical to make sure that we can get more direct flights here in, uh, in, in, in the Richmond region. Doug Bagby, one of the issues that's that's not a legislative issue, at least not at this point, uh, has to do with 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 state workers, and I suppose other workers as well, but particularly state workers who've been working 
uh, remotely. I know that some have said they should be returned to their offices and it would uh, boost the economy of the of the cities where they're they're working. Uh, others saying I saw a story this morning about how much it costs on gas and and everything else if you're if you're required to turn to return to the office. Uh, what do you hear from your constituents, or what's your perspective on that? Is uh, is the hybrid model do you think a, a one that works, or should uh, should employers, whether it's the Commonwealth of Virginia or other employers, say, "Come on back to the office. Uh, no more of this working remotely." Yeah, and, and I think um, moving away from the hybrid model, hybrid model is uh, short sighted. Um, disappointed with the governor's decision, uh, particularly since he's only been in office a couple of months and is not really familiar with uh, uh, the departments and the outfits at the, uh, as it relates to the agencies and services that, and, and, and staffing models of the Commonwealth. So it would have been great for him to take some time to learn and listen to the staff and, and, and the actual employees as opposed to uh, doing sort of a cookie cutter uh, uh, or making a cookie cutter decision. Uh, one of the things that we can do is again, listen to the employees. And what I have been, learned, because so many uh, state employees live in the Richmond region uh, and, 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 and in my district, is a lot of them were working from home even prior to the pandemic. And what the governor has said is, even if you were working at home prior to the pandemic, then you still have to go through this process. And, I, and what I'm hearing from staff and employees of the Commonwealth is that they're afraid to even uh, request to work from home because of how the governor and his team have frowned upon individuals working from home. But you hear from uh, individuals in the business community, which he touts, he's from the business community, continue to say, this is the new way. This is a way to save funds uh, for the organization and to make sure that we keep productivity up. Everything that I'm hearing from, uh, uh, from in the larger companies in the Commonwealth is suggesting that it's working when you actually have communications and protocols uh, and, and targets for those individuals that are work from, working from home. Now, and I don't think there's anybody would disagree that before this pandemic, it was no way you could convince uh, uh, local government, state government, big business, little business, that you could send workers home and they will actually do the work. Right. Um, but we have seen now, after being forced to do it, that it works. Uh, we have been forced to do so many things that we would would have never considered had it not been for uh, the pandemic. Even the way you and I communicate right now, um, we're doing it. We used to do it in the studio. Hopefully we'll be back in the studio soon. But that's the way that we are communicating uh, in the workspace as well, where you don't need to uh, wait for uh, Melissa and Johnny to show up to the office to have a meeting. Uh, you can all get on the Zoom at eight o'clock in the morning, knock that meeting out, and then move on with your day. Uh, and it's easier to schedule meetings and be productive and without individuals trying to move around town uh, to conduct business. There's a lot of things like that that are helping us uh, save uh, and then, as you bring those two together, we talked about the, the gas prices going up uh, and the governor saying he wants to help individuals uh, in their pocketbook with the gas prices. The way that you help individuals stay, uh, save money on gas is allowing them to reduce the amount of time that they're commuting to, uh, to the office. Uh, that will help them that will help the, uh, the uh, organization, and then it will also help the environment. 
Well, I'll tell you, uh, you could have uh, had your op-ed in today because you, you've certainly laid it out. Uh, it, and, and Bob Lewis did it in the Virginia Mercury and others are writing about it. So we'll see how this how this plays out. But let me let me move to something else, because even in the relatively short time so far that you've been serving in the General Assembly, you've been um, among the House Democrats. You've been in the minority. You've been in the majority. You've been in the minority. And I think it would be interesting to hear you reflect a little bit about uh, uh, the difference. If if the Republicans, if I were talking to a Republican, I could say the same thing, that you were in the majority, you were in the minority, you were in the majority. And how how is it different being a legislator when you're when you're a majority or minority? Well, it, it's a combination of things. And so I've been in the majority, and this is the, this is one another part of it. I've been in the minority with a Democratic governor. I've been in the majority uh, with a uh, Democratic governor, and I've been in the minority with a Republican governor. And I got to tell you, the last one sucks. <laughs> uh, uh, but. We we'll, we'll, we keep working, and one of one of the biggest differences is being able to uh, uh, share your ideas uh, with those individuals that are actually making the decisions and setting up the uh, committee meetings and making sure that everyone is heard. Um, they move up, the the Republicans and their committees move a bit faster. Uh, in, in the process. But one of the things that I've been happy that they kept, and, and this is going back to the results of the pandemic, is an individual that is not able to travel down or maybe intimidated to travel down to the Capitol and still able to provide testimony uh, online or, 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 or digital uh, mm-hmm. in our meetings. Uh, and that's a result of the technology that we had to put in place during the pandemic. But uh, it is no shock that it's tougher, much tougher uh, making an impact from the minority. But it also is is incumbent upon us to make sure that individuals in the Commonwealth are made aware of the decisions that are being made that I I believe are counter to where the Commonwealth is. Well, I think that it's uh, uh, certainly going to be uh, an interesting 23 session even as 22 still has a wrap up in the on the budget uh delegate bagby let me ask you something else and if if the subject is a little too sensitive and you'd rather not comment we'll certainly honor that but looking back over the years as some of us uh, old folks can do we have seen where uh particularly in the house of delegates when one of the parties is in the minority they end up changing their leadership. And uh, you've gone through a time here in the last six weeks or so of, of some transition and changing of, of leadership in House House Democrats. Um, any thoughts or comments you're willing to make about how, how, it's, how it looks going forward and uh, about the process and, and all? I'd be delighted to hear from you. Yeah, uh, it, it was a tough process, and um, you know, I have. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, walk around this thing. I'm going to talk straight about it because you you shoot me straight, so I'll shoot you straight. I am good friends with uh, Don Scott, and I'm good friends with Eileen Philicorn. Uh I have worked well, I believe, with both of them. Uh, Eileen as the speaker and myself as the uh, chair of the Black Caucus, we accomplished a lot together along with, with, with Governor Northam. And so um, my experience is that, my experience may not be the same experience that other members had working alongside um, uh, former Speaker Philip Horn. At the same time, I appreciate the passion 
and the dedication that Don Scott brings to the table. And in talking to both of them the, and the ent entire caucus, we are stronger than we've been before uh, going through this, having gone through this. And I just know that everyone is focused on winning the majority of that. Uh, and then we will go from there as it relates to selecting our leadership at that time. But it, it was a tough process. Um, I, I think we came up stronger uh, and, and, and more prepared than ever to do what it takes to win back the majority for one sole reason. And that is to protect the work that we've done related to uh, housing, related to uh, uh, public education, related to infrastructure, uh, related to public safety, related to protecting our colleges and universities and freezing tuitions and, 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 and uh, putting money in for infrastructure. The amount of money that this administration and, and the Republican uh, uh, regime on appropriations took out as, as it relates to infrastructure for colleges and universities is, I mean, in this environment where we have so much cash uh, and we took money out for infrastructure where we can invest in those HBCUs, um, it, it, it's sad. You know, one thing I was talking with some friends about just uh, over the last week, and I don't know where they had been missing the news, but they didn't realize that both the House and the Senate had agreed and in the budget before the governor that individuals and families will be getting uh, a tax refund. And and also the, uh, the, the other things that were done. So it was done between the Senate controlled by the Democrats and the House controlled by the Republicans. So there's... There's news about that that will be coming out. Delegate Bagby, before our time's up, I thank you for the conversation and, and, and your straight shooting, as you always do. Uh, anything else that you'd like to say to the residents of the 74th? Or what's the number of the new district? Uh, the new district will be 80. Okay. Our residents of the 80th would be give you the last remarks. Uh, I, I would simply say thank you, David, for uh, continues not only to have me on, but to bring individuals into uh, folks' office space and living rooms and wherever they're watching in their bedrooms. Uh, this information from so many individuals in the Commonwealth that are making decisions on things that impact their life and their family life. Uh, and so thank you for that work. And just... Uh, encouraging everyone to stay encouraged uh, as we fight through all the challenges. <laughs> I mean, we look at uh, women uh, uh, mm. needs as it relates to tampons and so forth and, 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 and uh, baby food and, and, and baby uh, instant, instant milk and so forth. It, it, who would ever thought we would be in this position uh, and how things that are, are, are cross seas and things that are happening in this commonwealth and in this country are right before us to make decisions. And those decisions are not just made in D.C. A number of those decisions are being made here, right here in Richmond, uh, to impact and to uh, protect the, 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 member, the citizens and members of, uh, of this community. Dr. Lamont Bagby, always delighted to have a conversation with you. We thank you very much.